when does the CCP and when does the sort of American national security establishment realize that superintelligence is going to be absolutely decisive for national power? I think the uh, the national security state is going to be starting to pay a lot of attention. Breaking, OpenAI appoints former NSA head Paul Nakasone to board. So Nakasone led the NSA from 2018 to 2023 and is leaving the NSA to join OpenAI's safety and security committee. He's saying we will help improve AI's role in cybersecurity by detecting and responding to threats quickly. His appointment follows concerns over safety culture at OpenAI, according to The Verge at least. Elon Musk can't wait for OpenAI to have access to his phone. I might be detecting a bit of sarcasm in that statement. Maybe. This is from OpenAI.com, the announcement of the addition of Nakasone to the board. OpenAI says, as a first priority, Nakasone will join the board's safety and security committee, which is responsible for making recommendations to the full board on critical safety and security decisions for all OpenAI projects and operations. Next, they're saying that the security of OpenAI systems, such as the training supercomputers, the compute clusters, the sensitive model weights, which can, by the way, somebody can just put in a CSV file, a thumb drive, and just walk out of the building. That is to say, as powerful as model weights are, they're fairly easy to, you know, move about if you get your hands on them. And the data trusted to OpenAI by the customers, you know, the security of those systems, they're central to achieving the mission of bringing about AGI, artificial general intelligence. Now, look, there's a lot of people that are very upset about this. Obviously, security is very important, but there are people that are very worried about what's going to happen, what this appointment means. Here's Edward Snowden, the Edward Snowden, still, I believe, living in Russia after being wanted for crimes in the United States after he published, after he leaked a lot of data about the amount of information that the NSA has access to. So this is a quick primer on Snowden. So he wrote this in 2021. He said, eight years ago, my life began. I was a climbing careerist in the American intelligence community, a former CIA officer and an NSA contractor until I discovered that my work and the work of my generation had in secret been turned towards the construction of history's first truly global system of mass surveillance, a machine dedicated to building perfect and permanent records of our private lives. I'll link his essay down in the description below. Wait, there's an FBI San Diego field office? Um, actually, I'm not going to link anything. You can find it yourself. The point being is that Snowden and lots of other people see this as a problem. Edward Snowden posted this I think within a few days of the appointment of the NSA chief saying they've gone full mask off. Do not ever trust OpenAI or its products, ChatGPT, etc. There's only one reason for appointing NSA government director to your board, meaning the ex-NSA director Nakasone. This is a willful calculated betrayal of the rights of every person on earth. You have been warned. Now we've covered the Leopold's Ash Brenner's situational awareness paper. He was the young fellow that appeared on the Dwarkesh Patel podcast talking about the potential explosion in intelligence that could come as early as 2027 or 2028. And one of the things he talked about is when will the US government, China government, everybody else kind of wake up to the situation? Because so far, they haven't been taking anything that most would consider drastic actions. So basically, he's saying if this green line represents kind of our technological progress, human progress as a whole, and this person represents where we are in time, then this is what we're approaching now. We're approaching a huge upward spike into the stratosphere of human progress, of technological progress. He lays out his argument in the paper very effectively. Now, I'm not saying he's right, he's wrong. I'm just saying he does know quite a bit. He worked at OpenAI in the now disbanded super alignment team. And basically, if I had to sum it up to a sentence, he's saying that in 2027, AI progress will reach this point where we will have automated AI research. And we've covered a lot of papers on this channel that certainly suggests that this is not science fiction. If you think this is science fiction, take a look at, for example, Eureka. This was a paper published by NVIDIA, Dr. Jim Fan, and others. He is a senior AI research scientist at, at NVIDIA. And they basically got GPT-4, yes, Chad GPT, GPT-4, to write something that's called reward functions for training robots. Reward functions are basically how we tell robots when they're doing something right and when they're doing something wrong for the purposes of reinforcement learning. So, so the robot kind of teaches itself how to do various things, how to run, how to juggle, how to rotate an object. And we humans, we're pretty good at teaching them to do stuff, but we've never been able to do certain tasks. Like for example, this pen spinning trick where a robot hand spins a pencil like kids do in school. We, we, we've never been able to 
figure out how to write a reward function that over time trains the robot to do this, for example. But guess who was able to write that reward function? Yes, you guessed it, ChatGPT, specifically GPT-4, the latest model from OpenAI, as far as we know. It generates the code, several different versions of the code that gets fed into the GPU accelerated reinforcement learning machine. So basically a simulation that follows the laws of physics where these robots are quickly able to run through the iterations and improve. The results are fed back into GPT-4. It looks at them and it's told to try to improve on it. It tries to improve on it, creating new reward candidate sampl sampling based on how well the previous one worked and it gets fed back into this uh, simulation again. And this loop keeps running. As you can see here with more iterations, with more, more little steps, more loops, the success rate gets better and better and better. You see this red line here? That's humans. That's our ability to do it. You see how Eureka, this model, gets better at writing those functions than humans are by, you know, a few iterations in. Most surprisingly, Eureka is better at doing the really hard tasks that humans struggle at. It comes up with novel rewards, new, never before seen ways of approaching that problem that humans tend not to come up with. And it significantly outperforms them, them being, you know, smart humans who do this for a living. So again, the reason I say that is because don't take this to be nonsense and take this to be science fiction. That idea that over time, as everything improves from technology to the algorithms to our understanding of AI, that eventually we'll hit an inflection point where AI will be much better at doing AI research. So self-improving AI, it will be much better than humans are at doing it. Now here's the piece in the paper that is important to the discussion that we're having now. He's saying on our current course, we may as well give up on having any American AGI effort. China can probably steal all the algorithmic breakthroughs and the model weights, which literally is a copy of the super intelligence, right? So if they have the model weights, which again, I mean, this is like, for example, Grok1. So this is Elon Musk's AI company, XAI. No, this is Igor Babushkin. So he's one of the main researchers and developers on that project. So these are the model weights. They're over here on GitHub. And if you wanted to have them, you click this button. So I, I checked off camera the size of the weights. It's 290 six gigabytes. But that's how you'd download Grok, for example. So when, you know, and if we have super intelligence, the model weights, we can assume might be just as easily transferable. And every iteration, every improvement up to that point might be easily sort of copied and pasted over, if you will. So he's saying in this current world of ours, right, in the private startups developing AGI world, super intelligence would proliferate to dozens of rogue states. It's simply untenable. And this is why I spent the last few videos covering what this guy is talking about. Because, as I said, I think he thinks pretty clearly about this stuff. He thinks through what's going to happen, how things will play out. This is me kind of patting myself on the back, if you will. Because a few days later, a few days after the interview, the podcast and the paper, OpenAI makes the announcement that this person, pal, like a Sony, brings world-class cyber cybersecurity expertise to OpenAI's board of directors and protecting the systems from increasingly sophisticated bad actors. Of course, community notes strikes again, right? And they're saying, like a Sony is the former director of the NSA. Under his watch, the NSA expanded programs to illegally surveil the U.S.'s own citizens. The Twitter files revealed a practice of a revolving door, practice of big techs hiring former agency members members to expand surveillance. Now, my point with all this isn't to say that OpenAI is either good or bad or that the NSA is either good or bad. My point here and before this, that a lot of the concerns that people talk about aren't really real concerns or matters of importance. Some people projected that AI will make sure that nobody has jobs. Some people said it will bring about like this perfect universal basic income and everybody can just relax and everything will be fine. Some people said, well, no, actually turn everybody into paper clips, kill everybody everybody off, etc. Maybe, maybe not, who knows. But before we even get into that, like we're not there yet. Long before any of that stuff happens, the various world powers, the various governments and large corporations and politicians will need to figure out who gets to make this technology, who gets to profit from it, who gets to control it. And if there will be wars or some authoritarian regimes like 1984, and whether or not there will need to be some sort of a global surveillance regime, making sure that nobody builds AI, a non-proliferation regime, as Leopold puts it. This was posted in the information yesterday. It's called How the World Plans to Stop American AI Domination. Countries and startups around the globe are scrambling for a foothold in artificial intelligence. 
determined to avoid becoming dependent on U.S. tech innovations. Because again, now, if you think about technology, U.S. is leading in a lot of respects. Facebook, Google, Apple, etc. are global. Lots of other nations rely on American companies. Dozens of AI companies in India, South Korea, France, and other countries around the world have come to a similar conclusion as this company that they're talking about in Germany, saying their nations can't afford to rely on the U.S. or China, for that matter, for what could be the 21st century's most most vital technology. And there's this idea, the catchphrase of sovereign AI. So we've heard that from Jensen Huang at the NVIDIA conference that each sort of nation should be building its own sovereign AI, or not necessarily nation, it could be like a culturally affiliated group of nations. And this is why, uh, you know, if you were buying NVIDIA from a long time ago when it was cheap, good on you. NVIDIA is certainly one of the key winners in this whole thing. They're saying AI will be a key engine of economic growth, and most of them see technological independence as a way to avoid getting caught in the middle of the growing tensions between China and the U.S. Interestingly, they have a uh, globe with, uh, in red, they have the various AI companies that are um, founded there. That is pretty interesting. I uh, haven't seen this before. This is pretty cool. UK, of course, we have DeepMind acquired by Google. So I don't know even know if that's necessarily, should be UK, but certainly built and founded and, and started there. Demi Sasabis and partners. They mentioned how China is being very aggressive against the likes of Facebook, Google, Amazon. They prevented them getting a toehold there. Of course, this allowed various Chinese companies to start up and become giants, companies like Tencent, Baidu, etc. Now in Europe, the regulators are getting ever more aggressive. Meanwhile, OpenAI could become a benefit corporation similar to rivals like Anthropic and XAI. So from the weird structure that they have now that had a not-for-profit arm and a for-profit arm and a whole bunch of different stuff. But Sam Altman said that one scenario they're considering is changing to a for-profit benefit corporation. Some people on Twitter were very confused about it, but uh, let's see if we can suss out the reasoning for this potential change. Uh, let's see. Such a change could open the door to an eventual IPO, initial public offering of OpenAI, meaning that this would allow them to be a stock and be sold on the stock exchange alongside NVIDIA, Google, Microsoft, Apple, etc. You might have recalled back in January when OpenAI changed policy to allow military applications. They had something in their statement, their terms of service or somewhere basically saying that it's not okay to use the GPT technology for military applications. And then that line, that paragraph went away. Some people started asking questions about it. So they clarified saying, our policy does not allow our tools to be used to harm people, develop weapons, for communications, surveillance, or to injure others or destroy property. There are, however, national security use cases that align with our mission. And these things could be sort of under the military umbrella, so to speak. We might be getting some more information into what that whole thing is about. So this is defensescoop.com. Microsoft deploys GPT-4 large language model for Pentagon use in top secret cloud. As they describe it here, it does look like, yes, it is some sort of a cybersecurity initiative that's going to allow the defense the Department of Defense to deal with the vast amounts of data. With the GPT-4 capability that Microsoft has deployed via their Azure OpenAI service, and DOD can fine-tune the models, so add their own data, fine-tune it for their own specific use cases, add their own unique workflows on top of that. And they think that OpenAI is, in their opinion, best in class. So what do you think about all of that? What does this mean for AI, for open AI, for every one of us moving forward? Whether you're in the United States or elsewhere in the world, I know a lot of my viewership is fairly global. I think only 34% of the people watching this are from US, even though I'm in the US, it's very global. And I appreciate all of you listening in and giving me the various sort of viewpoints and opinions on how you perceive things. So let me know what you think. Definitely state where you're from. Specifically, I'm curious if you're aligned more with somebody like Leopold Aschenbrenner or somebody like Edward Snowden, or at least sort of my perception of what they're saying. I hope I'm not misunderstanding what they're saying, but this is Aschenbrenner. He's saying the smartest people in the space have converged on a different perspective, one that he dubs AGI realism, right? So the idea of, you know, if we're serious for a second, how does this actually play out, right? So here he mentions the EX, the people that are accelerationists, climbing the Kardashian scale, right? Sort of pushing technology and humanity forward, which by the way, there's this idea of Dyson spheres where sufficiently advanced alien civilizations might build these mega structures kind of around their sun to harness the entire sort of energy output 
of the sun. And the idea was that if there are things like this, they'll have tons of infrared radiation that we'd be able to pick up on. Now, I wouldn't bet on this quite yet. I just find it fascinating that the stuff that I read as a kid, the sci-fi books, that's now the stuff that the news anchors talk about. Scientists believe they've spotted a Dyson sphere a thousand light years away. Is this evidence of a type 2 civilization on the Kardashian scale or something else? More at 6. Sorry, ADHD moment. But the point is that the EX are trying to accelerate to wherever we're going as fast as possible. On the other side, we have the Doomers. We've covered their beliefs quite a bit. And yeah, we got to give them credit for their prescience. I mean, they've been ahead of the curve. They realized where this is going. They kind of knew that AI is emerging and they were worried about stuff way before other people were really aware of it. But as Leo was saying, their thinking has become untethered from the empirical realities of deep learning. Their proposals, naive and unworkable. And they failed to engage with the very real authoritarian threat. Now, I do want to kind of ask your opinion on this because look i've been saying exactly this since the beginning of the channel so when i hear somebody saying the exact same thing i kind of go yes of course he's absolutely correct he's a genius but that could be just my bias that could be just my confirmation bias kind of here's somebody that knows a lot about ai where it's going he's on the inner circles of open ai and everything else and kind of seeing the same path that i am and certainly the appointment of nakasoni so he looks like left his role as the director of the nsa in february of 2024 and just a few short months later is now on the OpenAI board, you know, Microsoft, Azure, Pentagon, GPT-4 kind of all working together on their top secret cloud services. OpenAI potentially changing their structure to tap into the global capital markets by trading on the public markets. All that seems to align with this. Superintelligence is a matter of national security. If things are going where we think they're going, I don't think the various powerful governments all over the world would just kick back and relax. Leopold Brenner also thinks that America must leave He's worried about authoritarian regimes taking over and uh, using it to do bad stuff. Now he's talking about the need to not screw it up taking AI safety very seriously. So if you agree with what he's saying, well, all the things that's happening is just the next steps on that path. The blurring of the lines between the government agencies and the top AI labs is just the natural continuation of this. And then you have, of course, Edward Snowden saying the intersection of AI with the ocean of mass surveillance data that's been building up over the past two decades is going to put truly terrible powers in the hands of an unaccountable few. A lot of these organizations of course, they're not fully transparent. They deal with a lot of secrets, so they can't just report everything. But that, of course, brings up a lot of questions about, well, who's in charge? What are they doing? But where do you stand? Now, I'm sure no one's jumping for joy over this, for securing the development of AI and AGI, to make sure it doesn't get copied and pasted to everyone everywhere in the world. Or do you think this is just the absolute worst thing that can happen, that it, as Edward Snowden puts it, it gives terrible powers to the unaccountable few? Or are you somewhere in between? Let me know in the comments. I'll also put up a quick survey to see how people think so we can get kind of a sense for where everyone is. With that said, my name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.